Hello and welcome to Steve and Dave's Rock Art. This time around, we're taking a look at one of the uh, most influential and best recognized uh, album cover artists uh, from the 70s. Kind got his start in the 70s, but he's been busy since then. Uh, and we're talking, of course, about Roger Dean. Yeah. Um, maybe just a little bit about his, uh, his biography, first off. Um, how, uh, what his childhood was like, what those influences uh, in childhood led to uh, yeah. as an artist, as he, as he grew up. Um, Steve, do you have anything you want to share about Well, I, I think we you have to focus in on his, his time abroad, um, which I know you'll talk about in, in some um, detail here in a second. He also um, had a very close and supportive relationship with his family. Um, and that was a uh, that was a, a, a real point of strength, I think, for Dean. And I think it continues to be as he's long collaborated with his brother, which is an interesting uh, yes. pairing. Yeah. Um, but he's used those experiences from childhood and particularly this time abroad. Um, it really influenced the way he he saw himself, the way he saw art. And um, I, I think that there is a direct line between um, Roger Dean, the mature artist today. And this this time um, in childhood, I mean, it's a it's a really strong link. He's yeah, a, I agree. Um, yeah, and so was, yeah. maybe we should just, yes think a little bit about that. He kind of has um, design uh, in his blood. It was it was uh, inherited to him through his genes. His his mother had studied uh, dress design at the Canterbury School of Art. His father was an engineer in the British Army. Um, and because of that, uh, of course, his family did a lot of uh, moving around when he was a child. Um, much of his childhood was spent in Greece, Cyprus. And from the age of 12 to 15, uh, his family lived in Hong Kong. Yeah, it's hugely important. And that was, yeah, that was a particularly influential time. Um, he became uh, familiar with uh, Chinese landscape art and feng shui. But the thing that amazed him so much uh, about the Chinese landscape art is the, the degree to which they would go to create uh, an artificial landscape as a type of uh, uh, poem in imagery. Um, if that little pond there needed a, a mountain in the background to complete things, well, that's what they would put up there. Yeah, that's right. That's you know, right. and um, and this was extremely influential. And we see it again and again throughout his, it's kind of the, the red thread that, that uh, we see throughout his work. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, everyone's childhood is influential, but it's, it's interesting how he took those experiences and it just really kind of created a kind of artistic and kind of professional vision that was his, um, but he's followed for decades now. Um, and it's, it's unusual that you see that. I mean, there's, um, he's a very um, ambitious uh, individual. Yes. Who um, I think was gifted in a number, number of areas. And it's uh, his his experiences. So you have this this formative experience abroad, um, but when he returns uh, back to the UK, um, it's it's a little more complicated. And um, Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about his experience um, as a in, in art school? Um, because he, uh, um, I think, it very much is kind of what happens happened in this era of the early '60s in terms of sort of the pathway that you're supposed to follow and. And Dean got kind of caught up in, in all of that. All right. Um, Dean was born in August 1944. So 1961, um, he finds himself at the Canterbury College of Art right. studying uh, silversmithing and furniture design. Um, and talking about design, he was very critical of the... Of the uh, conventional wisdom that right. was being taught there about um, why 
well, as he put it, why do people live in boxes? Yes. You know, after we're we're in a modern age, we have modern design. Why are people still living in boxes? And his teacher's response was the classic, well, form follows function. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was never particularly happy with that. No, um, it wasn't satisfying. Right. It wasn't a satisfying response, right? Um, but I think you also have a, a an interesting anecdote from, from his time there. Um, well, I mean, there's, you know, there's a couple things, right? And so he's um, he's he's literally, um, he's scored, he has, again, I, I think it's fair to say he's a, a brilliant individual. And again, he's talented in many areas and um, maybe bordering on a kind of genius. And he scored particularly well, now you're going to have to help me out with this, Dave. He scored particularly well on an exam, which then put him in a different tract within the within the within the art school within the design school and he literally was and this is my understanding he was literally pulled out of class <laughs> one day and put into a, a, a different uh, a track within the design school based upon like a, a, a score a, a math score yeah yeah it was, it was some art class right and and um, he was there because it interested him that's what he wanted to be Look yeah. at him. They said, hey, "You don't belong in here. What are you doing here?" And and they they pulled him out of there. They uh, pulled him out and and let him in and let him in into a yeah a, a more kind of architectural design uh, area. You know, it's it's the '60s, but it's not the '60s. And one of the things that's so fascinating about Dean is that uh, his experience as a young person kind of he matures into this into the '60s. And I think he is he's very much a kind of child of the '60s in, in a way that he is. He represents then the kind of freedom, uh, the kind of confidence that many people in the '60s then, you know, kind of they blossomed, and they and, and Dean certainly certainly blossoms with this notion that you can kind of go down a kind of individual path, that nature really matters, that you know you, that the um, that the old paradigms need to be smashed, and so as you know, his particularly the '60s. He is a kind of um, he's a kind of creature of the '60s, and it's so interesting. Even today, you know, we're in the 21st century now. That that '60s ethos, which we'll take a look at here in a, in a bit, um, it's still evident in his in his art. It's still evident. He's he, if we could, I'd like to take a quick look at one of his student um, <clears throat> student projects, um, and I think this gives us a sense. And and David mentioned in your in your thoughts about this as well um, to to see um, what this says about about Dean and his view of the world. This is a chair. Uh, this is the famous sea urchin chair, a student, a student project. And um, what, what do we what do we learn about Dean, do you think, Dave, by this by recognizing the fact that this is in, in Dean's mind a chair? Well, um... And this became known, of course, as the sea urchin chair. Um, and that suggests that he's getting his inspiration for form, at least, yes, yes. from nature. That's exactly right, yeah. Um, and it's said that the beanbag was kind of, this was a precursor to the beanbag. I find this so superior to any beanbag I've ever oh. <laughs> seen or, or sat in that... Yeah. It I, seems like a real uh, de-evolution to me. Have to agree. The beanbag is like this kind of cruel joke uh, foisted upon society. I mean, it's just like you can get into a beanbag, but you can't get out. And um, but yeah, so Dean is. I mean, Dean sees the world in a very different way, a very specific way, and it's clear that he was going to uh, run up against problems within the design school. I mean, it just he did not fit into the academy in that regard. He just. He, his mind was taking him in different places. Well, in, in 1965, he, he uh, enrolled in the Royal College of Art. And um, to just enforce what you've been saying, um, what was he What was he interested <laughs> in? He uh, His research was the psychology of architecture. Right. The psychology and of architecture. Exactly. Yeah. How you make people feel comfortable in their uh, surroundings. Uh, because... 
theoretically, they should feel comfortable uh, where they're spending all their time. Uh, he did a thesis about, quote, producing a sense of tranquility yes. in domestic architecture. This is, yeah, this is really interesting. This is an area that he has explored off and on for the past uh, six or seven decades, um, the notion of, of house design, domestic design. It also, his entry into all of this coincides with the development of something called gunite, which was a, a, a pourable, spreadable, almost kind of flexible concrete, um, which enabled then um, new, new kinds of designs with, in, with, in, a, in a domestic sphere. So you no longer were you uh, bound by, uh, by, by rigid lines and rigid angles. And so it's, um, again, we're going to talk and focus our attention primarily on Dean as, the, um, <clears throat> as a, an album cover genius. Uh, but he has a uh, lots of other interests, and uh, and certainly domestic design is one of them. Yeah, uh, and uh, some of that bleeds into his his That's true. Uh, uh, covers as well, uh, especially the architecture um, element. Yeah, um, I agree. So we'll we'll see that it's 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 certainly not completely lacking, but um, one has the feeling that had he had the resources and um yes had the interest been there yes. uh, he would have gone all in for architecture oh i agree completely um, I, that's absolutely the case yeah. he had he had planned like a 15 piece uh uh series on on architecture on the philosophy of architecture for bbc um yeah, they didn't. They didn't have the money uh, or the inclination at the time to to uh, support that. But a, apart from a, a clear uh, graphic talent, uh, Dean is a it's an idea guy for practice. sure. It oh, just, that's no it question. Like he yeah, use you know, coming up with different ideas and different concepts all that's, the time. That is that's absolutely right. You know, in everyone's in everyone's life and everyone's career, there's a fair amount of chance involved. And I think, as we'll talk about here, right, there's a you know, chance plays a role in Dean becoming this album cover. You know, uh, you know the the icon that we know today is is Roger Dean. But um, had things broken a little bit differently, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, house design, the domestic sphere. You know, there's no there's no question that this was a passion of his, and he had a great talent and who knows? I mean, everybody's life goes different directions, but given his druthers, I think he would have been very happy investing all of his time and energy, creating new ways of, of living uh, within uh, the domestic sphere. Yeah. Um, so, as you said, the, the first indication of this in terms of actual product, stuff that he's actually putting out, is the sea urchin chair. Yeah, that's um, right. And he was chosen from one of like four students from uh, the London uh, mm -hmm. College of Art um, to realize uh, this uh, a project uh, that that this furniture um, manufacturer um, and that was a Cheryl Cheryl Shear uh, mm -hmm. factory and uh, this. This chair re remains one of her favorite, uh, one of her favorite pieces that, that they uh, created there. It's true, and it's part of the permanent co collection at the Victoria and Albert Museum now. By the way, it's it's really considered a classic. And people walk by it and go, "Roger Dean, hmm, that that rings a bell somehow." Yeah, it, yeah. Um, but sure, it, again, it's it's the '60s. Um, it, his furniture design uh, was of the time and it was getting a lot of attention. I mean, people really responded to it. It was obviously, it was different, um, but there was something about it that was familiar, that was comfortable, that people responded to in a very positive way. And so, um, yeah, I mean, he was really and, starting to take off. And, and and he was 23 year old, 23 years old um, yeah, yeah. at the a time, kid. right? So yeah, it's a kid, uh, yeah. a young man, and getting to start the next year during his third year at the Royal College, um, Dean was assigned a project uh, to uh, design a contemporary landscape, seat, mm -hmm. seating landscape, 
Yes. Um, at the upstairs of uh, Ronnie Scott's this is, Jazz Club. This has got to be, th yeah. This has to be his, I mean, this has to be his big break on some level, right? That the, the Ronnie Scott, uh, the Ronnie Scott gig, if you will. Ronnie Scott's is um, has long been a club uh, in the heart of London that has been, uh, it's it's obviously an incredibly important music venue. Um, and, and during the 60s, I don't know if there was any place in London that was more important than Ronnie Scott's, but it's also a very important kind of meeting place for movers and shakers. And so a kind of, a kind of power lunch venue, if you will. And so lots of people uh, day and night made their way through Ronnie Scott's. And when Dean got this opportunity to design uh, you know, a space within Ronnie Scott's, lots of people saw it. I mean, lots of people saw it. Lots of people from various walks of life. Not so, not just hippies, right? But people from all walks of life. And and it really, um, I think, by all accounts, uh, really connected with people. There was something about it that was, um, it really just spoke to the era. And people just they they wanted more in a way. Fast, but for 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 I don't think it's my any question. This is Dean's big break on some level. The Ronnie Scott's gig is enormously important. Well, and um, while he was putting that together, while he was working in the club and and and, and doing this, um, of course, uh, all sorts of people were uh, moving yes. in and out. And right, and one of them was um, the manager of one of the club's like house bands called Gun. And uh, he took a look at the at the these like architectural design sketches for this thing. But there's another sketch, just kind of for fun, of kind of a, a, a demonic underworld. Yes. And he said, oh, that's neat. I think that would really work. This is right. As an album cover for, for Gun, for, for my band. Um, so uh, yeah. he, he, he said it, the, um, the A&R man, uh, from DECA, David Howells, gave the green light, mm -hmm. said, go ahead and do that. Uh, and so that's what he did. And, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is the thing. It's just so, this just so peculiar that it is in fact, right. It's the Ronnie Scott's, um, the Ronnie Scott's, uh, opportunity. Then that leads to then the area where Dean makes, you know, makes his biggest impression, um, as an album cover, cover artist, this is, yeah, here we go. You know, if you're if you're a Roger Dean fan, uh, familiar with dozens of his album covers, you might not guess. It's a little out. Yeah, I agree that this was Dean. Yeah, because hey, it's this is... it's not particularly typical for anything that he created afterwards. But um, that's right. He received it's... five thousand pounds for this, and he decided that maybe. Creating album covers was not a bad way to earn some money. That's right. I mean, a, a practical man at a heart, I suppose. I mean, right. And so, and it, it's it's still early enough, right? So it's still early enough in the rock era where the album cover is still where people are still just starting to sort of address the notion that this is a kind of could be a kind of statement. Obviously, the Beatles took this in a very interesting and important direction. But other bands and, and 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 band management started to think more fully about album covers. I mean, right? We've talked about this briefly before, but the, you know, historically, album covers and popular music were basically just you know a stock photo of of, of the artist, and sometimes yes. not even that. Um, well, you had, the, yeah, you, you know, for the Frank Sinatra fans and the Dean Martin fans out there. You put their face on the albums. So they know which artists you're talking about. That's right. You put the title of the album out there, and that's it. That's, that's your cover. it. That's your cover. What, and, what else do you need to do? And, and, and that I, had always worked fine. But um, the 60s, this is also something that uh, became one of the innovations of the 60s. That's right. And, that's exactly you right. know, really, one of the things that uh, first blew his mind. Um, this is what yeah, this. Really Really good point. <clears throat> yeah, uh, he he saw uh, this Grateful Dead album, and it just blew him away. He thought that is incredible. 
Um, at that point, he probably, he wasn't even thinking about doing album covers himself, but this certainly suggested to him that this was, uh, that this square foot of, of cardboard uh, could be a, a place to find artistic expression. That's, I think that's well said. I mean, I think that's absolutely right. He bought this album before he even had a record player. That's how, that's well, how impressed uh, he was with that. So we don't, we have no we have no sense of what he thought when the when he put the album on, um, but uh, but right but it and so from there then um, a spark is ignited, and Dean starts to see himself I think a, a little differently, and I think he sees a kind of career path, and 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 it, and it presents itself in a very specific kind of way. Well. You know, uh, and, and even if you're interested in other things, uh, you have to earn a living. Got to pay the bills, yeah. Sure. And it, it seems like this uh, was a fairly easy way to do it. Well, I think that's right. I mean, that's how he even describes it. He doesn't, I mean, it was not, at least initially, all that laborious. It was, these were, you know, this was a kind of, um, a kind of lark for him. And, uh, and he's getting paid for it. So what's better than that? Strangely enough, um, the majority of his early work was was done for uh, a jazz label. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's Vertigo right. Or something yeah, like that. that's it right. Wasn't. And it just wasn't, he wasn't real happy with that. Uh, he, he wanted to be doing rock albums. He wanted to do something um, well, yes. which could take him in a direction that's more along his lines. Um, but he did get the occasional album, and uh, we'll take a look at that here. Um, this yeah, was uh, this is the second album that he uh, I... did. Earth and Fire. Now, Earth and Fire was uh, the eponymous uh, debut album of uh, this Dutch band. But, yes, but it has, I mean, but, okay, so there's Roger Dean, right? And so um, the, the use of nature, right? Um, the the funky, tight spaces. Funk, a funky tree. Funky tree, uh, the expansive roots. It's, um, there. yeah, I mean, that looks... Yeah, that's Roger Dean. That's identifiable. And you know, this it, the, the funny thing is these these roots that you see on the other side through whatever there is there. It's a, it kind of is a mix between a peace sign and a, a, an yes. insect mask. That's know? right. So, so it's yeah. Um, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot going on. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the image, which is also a you know kind of standard for Dean. I mean, it's. It's and it is interesting, Dave, that um, he really he felt dissatisfied in in the in the jazz arena. That this is not really where he wanted to be. That he did that the music didn't speak to him in the way that the rock music did. I mean, I think that's a part of it. By the way, just real quick, um, are you familiar with Earth and Fire at all? Uh, well, you will not you will not be surprised. Uh, no, I'm not. Well, they were. Uh... They were apparently a fairly big deal in the uh, in the Netherlands in the in the seventies. Um, the first single that came out from this album was called "Seasons," and it was written by uh, George Koeymans. Here we go. Golden Earring. It's a small world after all. It yes. is, and this it was the first of eight straight singles uh, for that group to make the top five in the Netherlands. So well, just to, yes. fire, we've never heard of them, but if if we were Dutch, we would have. I I think you're right. Yeah, that's right. So, and that was his first, um, his second uh, album cover uh, for a rock band, and he, in between, he had to do some other types of work because he was he was rejecting the the jazz work that was being offered to yeah. him. He was shopping his his portfolio around, and that would pay off in the end. But um, until then, he had to find some other, a couple other things to do, and uh, 
what he ended up doing was um, some logo work. This was his first logo oh, yeah. for Fly Records. Uh, that's from 1970. A couple of years later, he would do one for a record label that was uh, became more of a powerhouse. Yeah, this is the, well, we don't remember Fly Records. Uh, yeah, the Virgin label. Yeah. The Virgin. Um, label. Now, my with recollection the, with the mirrored twin virgins. And here again, we have a funky tree. It's always a funky tree. The use of nature. Uh, also, the the lettering um, is very very Dean. And an exotic. Uh, reptilian being that we don't actually find anywhere on earth that's yeah. also found in a number of the covers he's going to be uh, coming out all, all true so this is the virgin label this is of course famously started by um uh, richard branson um branson who had um had a, a record stores in london uh, branched out to uh to recording and then of course he's involved in all sorts of things today they didn't stay with this logo very long as i, I recall this this was not maybe you know more about that I, it, it strikes me that the, that the virgin moved on from this pretty pretty quickly yeah i really don't know i um i don't know how long they were using it I, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I do remember i do remember seeing records with that with that logo on it. It's interesting. Um, I think that this is right. And so the, those who, uh, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll be corrected in the comments. Um, so what was the first, um, what was the first record that Virgin, the Virgin label put out? It's quite famous. Oh. And it's, the, the, the title track is, well, it's basically the, the album. I don't know. It's Tubular Bells. Oh, really? Okay. I believe that's right. The first on the Virgin, the first on the Virgin label, but My um, yeah. Um, so uh, it's <sighs> Dean is, as you're suggesting, um, while he's having some success, he's still actively sort of marketing himself. It's worth noting that London is a um, a kind of meeting place of all sorts of of individuals, right? And so it's. It's obviously a huge city, but it's also a kind of small town and that people of like mind are hanging at the same restaurants, going to the same parties. Uh, you know, people know each other, they're familiar. And so there are sort of, there are connections being made um, constantly um, as he, you know, gets the, the beginning phases of his career. Well, and, and, and one of the connections uh, ha has already been made, and that was with uh, David Howells. This Dick uh, uh, A and R guy, yeah, uh, who signed off on the gun deal. He approached Dean um, maybe a year later and uh, said, "Well, we have this uh, uh, group from Ghana, um, Ozzy Biza. Yeah, they've, uh, they've come out with an album, and I was just wondering if you'd be w willing to do that, uh, that cover for that." And he did. This is yeah. This is a this is an interesting one. Um, it, it, portions of this, it it my recollection of this, Dave, is that um, this really starts to this really makes an impression um, that the portions of this really connect with people in London. And that it almost becomes a kind of not so much the the, the album cover, but portions that becomes a kind of symbol, right? That people see this and in, it becomes a symbol of something people kind of unify around it, particularly the uh, these funky elephants. Well, when, when he was told that he was going to be uh, doing this for uh, a group from Ghana, he decided he wanted to come up with some, some faux African fairy tale type of thing. And yeah. so he'd, he'd leave architecture out of this. Right. He'd come up <laughs> with uh, flying elephants. Well, of course he did, and like the like the elephant that just landed on the on the right side of this, it made a huge splash. That, that's a good one. No, nah. ah, uh, you've got good writers. The um, it did make a huge splash. People they, 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 um, love that elephant. Yes, from the cover, 
And this poster sold tens of thousands of copies. That's exactly right. It was a, yeah, it was a. In college of, students, uh, dorm that's, rooms, that's everywhere. It. it became a kind of symbol of uh, that, a kind of, almost a kind of code, right? That if you had that poster, you know, it, it meant something. It's it's funny. Um, I mean, I understand that he, you know, this he doesn't work with this group forever, but this particular image, it's really interesting. The flying elephant thing is is really well, interesting. And as is typical, uh, when he does work with a group uh, more than once, uh, he, he generally tries to tie it in with the previous stuff that he's done for them. Now, uh, this became so big that he was basically able to decide what he wanted to do from there. Right. But this That's is it. really the first Dean cover that shows us where he's going. This, I think that's fair. It's the first one that we can say, okay, that's classic Dean. Right I there. think that's right, yeah. Uh, and we have the funky trees again. We have a little reptilian creature uh, in uh, the foreground. Like always, yeah. Uh, and uh, also very typical is that um, the, the front cover is only one half of a complete picture on the gatefold. Well, this is right. This he does this a lot. He does this a lot. Yeah, and this is one of the great uh, one of the great advantages of albums, which we've talked about before in previous rock art episodes. But there is, um, yeah, the gatefold provided artists a, a tremendous opportunity, and Dean took advantage time and time again. So, Ozzy Biza, uh, Ozzy Biza struck while the iron was hot. Yeah, and, uh, put out a second album in 1971. Uh, which, of course, Dean also did the cover for. We have uh, fewer elephants, but more reptilian you know, creatures. Right. Yeah, it's, it, it, one wonders, I mean, there's no way of knowing this, but one wonders how many people bought the second album based on the cover alone. I mean, we've both done that kind of thing. But yeah. saw the elephant, oh, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, snapped it up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so... That's that's that, and, and this this led um, to Dean doing nearly forty album covers between the beginning of nineteen seventy one and the end of nineteen seventy three. He was he became incredibly busy uh, during that period. Uh, a number of them were one offs, like. Uh, the Gentle Giant Octopus. Uh, it's very cover. interesting prog band, yeah. Yeah, and uh, this is also a, a really well-known uh, one of his. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, and some of them were the beginning of, of longer associations. <clears throat> yeah. Like with Uriah Heep. This was their um, fourth studio album, Demons and Wizards, and introduced uh, the the figure or the character of uh of the wizard right if, if there's a band there there are two bands really associated with dean and this is this is this is one of them um and uh yeah it's classic dean and and uh again here we have a number of elements that uh we're going to see again and again one of them is yeah uh, some sort of planet or sun yeah. Uh, funky tree, rock formations uh, without end, and and here uh, waterfall or ice. Always, yeah. Uh, it's, it's difficult to say for sure, um, but this is also uh, uh, very typical, and uh, this is going to be followed up the same year, 1972, uh, with uh, the Wizard's Birthday album. Mm -hmm. From yeah. uh, Uriah Heep. Yeah. And will also feature uh, the figure of the wizard. Yeah. It's, um, you know, where are the right angles? There aren't any. It's a Roger Dean cover. So it's, yeah, so it's it's clear that he's beginning, he's really beginning to make waves um, uh, as an album cover artist. It's um, enough so. This is one of the bizarrest things of, of all. Yeah. That he is, attracts the attention of, of Motown. God, their, this is so strange, yeah. Their chart blusters, volume six, uh, 1972. Um, 
And this is an album that would have sold regardless of what cover you put on it. But it seems like a very strange choice. I, it, to to, yeah. So, I mean, uh, Barry Gordy signed off on this, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah. We've got we've we've got nothing. I mean, maybe those, those watching have an explanation. Feel free to put it in the comments. But it is a this is a this is baffling. Yeah, it's funky and it's strange, but it doesn't it doesn't seem to be anything that the target uh, audience of Motown would be no nope. nope. <laughs> drawn to. I mean, this album it, had never can it, say goodbye on it. Jackson Five, Indiana wants me. <laughs> River Deep Mountain High from Temptations and the Four Tops. Just My Imagination, also Temptations. Yeah. I'm the only one you need, the miracles. It's full, chock full of huge hits, of chart busters. Yes, it's, it looks like a mistake at the factory. Yeah. I mean, it's just like something happened in the printing process. I mean, it, it, there's just, it's inexplicable. And it's, a, and it's a one-off for Motown as far as I know, right? They didn't go down this road again, but... They gave it a they gave it a go. Right. Strange. Well, what we what we see here, uh and, and the interesting part about this is this is also something that that he experiments with again and again. Um here a type of bionics. Uh, yes, that's very true. Good machine right. um uh, animal mix and um and we will have not just bionics but also the idea that the artificial structures in nature create new things. But uh, this is one of the first places we see it. Yeah. It's, it's, that's we great. see it here as well. Uh, quite uh, used, used to, to affect it. And what happened is um, Dean was out uh, for a hike one day and discovered the skull of a seagull. Yeah, and took it home, and uh, he ended up mounting it on the front of uh, a model jet plane. Well, of course he did. That he had there, and uh, apparently it ended up looking something like this. Yeah. Now, this you can think what you want about this, but this really ended up. Um, attracting the attention and, and capturing the imagination of some NASA engineers. Uh, one guy had a 150-foot-long hangar and painted that all along one wall of it. And uh, I think it was the same guy, ended up creating a space drone based on that Painting. Now, I I have yet to see a picture of that. Yeah, it sounds. I would love to, but uh, I was not able to find one. Well, that's a heck of a story. It, it but it's it does speak to the idea that the dean is the dean's imagination is being uh, absorbed by uh, thousands, really millions of others. Right? That he's he, the language, his artistic language, is being embraced by people really across the world. And it's um, it's it's fascinating um, how an artist can do this. Um, it's maybe, you know, a, it's a very much a kind of, um, maybe it's a kind of 70s thing. I'm not quite sure, but album art was important. It just was important and people paid attention to it and really embraced it in all sorts of very interesting ways. Yeah. Um, this is... Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. This is from Greenslade, their debut album. Uh, they only ended up doing two. Um, but here we see a, a couple of elements that are uh, reminiscent of Uriah Heep's. Yeah, right. this is right. You almost think it's a Heap. But yeah, right. We have the the waterfalls, the interesting waterfalls, and it all is going upward, upward. Um, don't actually see any funky trees here, but what we do see is something that also is going to make numerous uh, uh, 
appearances on on uh, Dean covers, and that is this mushroom like yeah. mushroom like fungi. Uh, yeah, groups. is and, are they are they yeah are they fungi are they stalagmites? I mean, nobody's really sure, but they're almost in every Dean image. It seems yeah, and, and sometimes they're clearly organic. Sometimes they're clearly um, mineral. Mm -hmm, but right. uh, that form is one that he apparently finds quite fascinating. And um, so, and here in the middle, we have a little bridge going over the waterfall and bridges and pathways. Oh, that's right. Bridges and pathways that are mixed. It's something that uh, he's, he's very obsessed with. Um, but here is the Greenslade, uh, Greenslade wizard. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said before, uh, when working for the same people, he tends to use the same imagery. By the way, I don't know if you see it up here. I don't know if this is wizard or uh, a couple or whoever it is, but he's not alone. He's just dominant in this. And again, this is the entire gatefold. So here he is again. I mean, he has five hands and a, a slightly funkier hat. Um, he's in a more urban environment, but it's oh. clearly still the Green Slade Wizard. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the, the same year. Uh, this is from the Green Slade's second album, Bedside Manners Are Extra. Uh, and then. This will be three years later, but it's Greenslade again, Dave Greenslade as a solo artist uh, for Cactus Choir. Mm -hmm. But we see the figure uh, remains the same. Um, listen, before we go on to talk about uh, the next big thing in, in his career, um, sure. let's Let's talk about uh, something that 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 he did that was not in, entirely involved with uh, album covers. Yeah, this is a. It, it is um, as we record this. This is the fiftieth anniversary of the release of uh, Kubrick's uh, Clockwork Orange, and Dean has the distinction, and I guess that's the word, of designing uh, a fair amount of uh, furniture and uh, and set work. Uh, in 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 the film, and um, going uh, back to along with his brother Martin, and by, by, by Martin, right? And going back to an earlier comment regarding just sort of um, it's it's a small world and London is a small place. Um, you know, it is the case that um, the the music industry, the movie industry, um, visual art, they're all sort of swimming in the same waters in this era, and. Um, it's really, um, it's one of the things that makes the film, I think, quite um, compelling is this kind of futuristic, and I know you'll have some comments about this, Dave, but this, this futuristic uh, design that really gets, speaks to Dean's passion for domestic design and, and, and house design and furniture design, sort of where he, where he starts. It is... Um, you know, I, I think it's probably this is probably the the the, the best known um, <clears throat> the best known image um, in the film. This is uh, the, the, Zine, the Dean's design of the so-called retreat chairs, um, and this is uh, this leads us into one of the most kind of shocking uh, moments of the film. But that it's clear that this is the. That this is the future, and how do we know it's the future? Well, part of it is the the way people live and 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 how they live, and the design here is is um, is quite provocative, and it really harkens back to Dean's student days. Um, and this is kind of a one off for Dean um, in terms of uh, film work um, and, and working with Kubrick specifically, but um, film set design in in, in general. But it's 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 a footnote, but I think it's an important footnote. I mean, because this is this is a this is a meaningful film, and uh, Dean's contributions really add something um, significant to it. Well, and it's it's definitely speaks 
um, for the the notoriety that he had already achieved. Uh, I think that that's absolutely young right. Man, yeah, um, that he was approached by Kubrick because um, this idea of futuristic design. Um, what sort of environments are we going to be living in? Uh, That's right. Years from now, who can say? Uh, it's it's a, a real challenge to come up with things like this that aren't simply uh, absurd. And Kubrick had already had the problem uh, or the challenge rather with uh, two thousand one Space Odyssey. Yeah, that's right. Um, and and came back, did it again, and and wanted. Uh, Dean to help him out with this. Uh, yeah, so. it's 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 really it's really an interesting moment uh, for Dean, and uh, and and maybe it's maybe it's nothing more than than trivia at this point. But I think that I do think that the the film is advanced by. I mean, it it's advanced by Dean's work. I mean, it does make it it does make a difference. Uh, here you can see Kubrick and uh, Malcolm McDowell sitting in a couple of Dean designed uh, chairs. It's yeah, it's a fascinating moment. Again, it's one of those what ifs, you know, had Dean gone down this road, had he had the opportunity, you know, maybe he would have contributed more. Um, but he, this is, okay, so this is a kind of, a, a, a kind of detour in a way, but an interesting one. Yeah, the loss of, uh, furniture design's loss is uh, album cover's game. I think that's right. I think that's fair. Um, all right. As part of his efforts to drum up some um, some business in the in the rock industry, uh, Dean had started sending around his portfolio uh, to various music company executives. One of them landed on the desk of Phil Car uh, Phil Carson, mm -hmm. who was the European general manager of Atlantic Records. Right. He liked what he saw, and he contacted Dean and told him that uh, he was responsible for two groups from the Atlantic stable. Uh, one of them was Led Zeppelin, and the other was a, a group called Yes. Pretty good, and, pretty good uh, gig, by the way. If he, would, if he was okay with that, uh, Arthur would just call him next time one of them came up with a, a, an album. And uh, so interesting, cover. yes. As it turns out, Yes was the first of the two groups yes. to come up with something. So that's um, and that's, that, was yeah. fourth, that was their fourth album, uh, Fragile, and that expressed the group's um, collective state of mind. I, guess, I think that's fair. At the time, yeah. this was a, um, a kind of make or break album for them in a way, and yeah, and it so. It became a huge album in the United States. It became sort of the album, the yes album in the United States, and this cover was a part of that. Yeah, and uh, the funny thing is, uh, the band just had something like a uh, a broken piece of porcelain, uh, maybe a, a photo or a painting of a, a broken piece of porcelain in, in mind. Uh, but Dean pitched uh, a story about. Living on a planet that was breaking up. Uh, sorry, this is in quotes. Living on a planet that was breaking up. So they had to build a space arc to find another planet to live on. Yeah. And they towed all the little bits of the planet with them. And we see here uh, this, this schism uh, running uh, through the planet. And uh, on the back cover, we actually see... Uh, the planet broken up into its uh -huh. uh, into yeah. its bits. Um, this story is, is really reminiscent to me of the Neil Young song uh, "After the Gold Rush." Yes, well, it's in it's it's in the air, right? Right, it's, it's in the just, air in this uh, era. It really picks up on the popular theme of environmentalism. We have one planet, and. Um, maybe maybe we're not going to come up with a space arc to just that's right drag the pieces maybe we're keep, not keep it together this you are this is i think uh, this is an important point i think that um and we've mentioned this before the um the potency of the environmental movement in the early 1970s and the um, the, the genuine fear of um a kind of you know coming coming apart 
a kind of a, a apocalypse. Um, obviously, we live in a world that's dom dominated by uh, climate change today, but there, there were people who were onto this early. And, um, you know, it's interesting that Dean was so, so fixated uh, on the environment, the power of the environment, but also the fragility of the environment. And it seems a kind of perfect melding of, of artist, of visual artist and musical artist here. This is, um, yes, really, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but yes, really then fully incorporates Dean into, in, into the band in a way. And they really run with his visions. Um, and he very much uh, is a contributor. So he is no mere artist. He's no, it, it's not just a kind of a, a, a cover guy. Um, he is, he's sort of in conversation with the band um, in very interesting ways, in ways that I think uh, we don't see, we don't see with other bands and other, and other visual artists, other cover artists. This, they're, they're really talking to each other for years. Well, and, and you can understand if their concept was, uh, we'll show a little bit of, uh, we'll show a broken teacup. Uh, and this is what they end up with. Well, clearly they had every reason to be very thankful. Oh, that that's, that's well said. Yeah, I mean, you're right. So, um, but yeah, I think after this album, they were sold on the idea. Yes, he can do our covers from now on. Um, and that's in fact what uh, what happens. Then um, they followed uh, "Fragile" uh, with "Close to the Edge" from 1972, and here we see the first uh, bubble logo. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, that they would continue using uh, throughout their entire career. Yes. So millions of T-shirts later, um, yes. right, this is where yeah, this is where the bubble logo starts. A very minimalist yeah. cover, but but the they logo came is up the with that with the logo while traveling from London uh, to um, Brighton on on the train, um, and the band was so pleased with it that they only they really only wanted the new logo on the cover, um, and and just. Very simple, very basic. Um, but that actually ended up working well for him because um, that allowed him the inner yes. gate fold without any printing or wording on it. Well, this, and um, this, this expresses the idea of close to the edge when the entire mountaintop here is a lake just falling away into uh, waterfalls all around. Yes, right. And it's all close to the end. Um, we mentioned before his uh, his obsession with pathways and bridges, and we, we see that here. Um, but he got this uh, the inspiration for this um, during a visit to Haystacks, which is a, a tall hill in the mm -hmm. uh, Lake District. Um, taking a picture at the summit, he noticed the whole thing was surrounded by, by lakes. This hill was just really surrounded by lakes. And um, he just asked himself, well, what if the hilltop itself uh, were a lake? We, what would that look like? How would that... Yeah, so anyway, that's what he came yeah. up for yeah. that. That was 1972. This was followed by Yes Songs. Um, yes Songs was the first live album. The first uh, of first of, of many. First of many. The uh, yes Song, right. But uh, Dean and his printer, uh, Tinsley Rubor, secured a patent to allow a gatefold to expand to any number yeah, of... This is, this is really interesting. Uh, yeah. ...of folds, kind of like a map, I guess. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. So theoretically, uh, you can have a gatefold that was six by six. A 36 square foot gatefold would be possible using this patented well, uh, method that they came up with. It was the 70s, after all, and an age of uh, was, was uh, an ex of age of excess, perhaps. So yes. right. And that age of excess was met by uh, the reality of all sorts of shortages among which paper 
Uh, was, well, there's always something. It's always something with Dean. Uh, reality just never seemed to be quite ready for his. Uh, uh, that's that's for sure. That's for sure. Anyway, this uh, this interesting little uh, sailing ship that we saw in Fragile has has transforms into something more organic mm -hmm. uh, but it's this is essentially the sequel to the fry uh the fragile story i think that's right yes it's well this, said it this picture um was known as escape here the ark uh, is apparently towing the planetary fragments through space here we have uh arrival where the fragments land in the waters of a new world, apparently a much, much larger world. Um, yeah. And uh, the fish looks on. Expansive, uh, pushing boundaries, just like the band, right? Yes, exactly. And here again, uh, it's all reminiscent of, uh, yeah, the mushrooms. So this, the awakening, the new landscape becomes the habitat for various plant and animal species. And finally, the probably the, the single most iconic uh, figure, this is Pathways. Uh -huh. uh, and again, yeah. a bridge has been built That's right. and a pathway to the top of this rock. So... Uh, we see themes explored and expanded upon, uh, and that is essentially uh, yes songs, oh, right? Followed by this in 1973, um, tales from topographic oceans. Yeah. Now. I think this is probably the most, the single most complex conceptual cover of of anything that he. Uh, I yeah I yeah I wouldn't disagree with that. There's uh, there's a lot going on here. It was inspired by uh, a half baked discussion uh, between uh, Dean and and John Anderson uh, during a trip to the uh, concert in Japan. Okay. Uh, it was a long plane ride and the band ingested a uh, hashish cake uh, shortly before taking off. It's the and, 70s after yes. all. Yes. Uh, Dean says uh, he was, well, the whole band was in a stunned silence uh, until, until yeah. around Anchorage. Um, but then they uh, kind of thought out and while they were flying over Siberia, we uh, he and John Anderson were were looking down at the landscape, and they just started talking about stuff. One of which was a uh, a book that Dean had uh, just done the cover for, known as uh, "The View Over Atlantis" by by John Mitchell. And um, this this book postulated that there were so called ley lines that had originated in Atlantis that connected all of the sacred or mystic sites on earth. Uh, and uh, well, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but uh, Anderson was talking about the autobiography of a yogi um, that first made its big hit with, uh, with Elvis Presley and had made the rounds in the rock world uh, since then. Um, that's by Paramahansa Yogananda. Can you just, just um, it first made its rounds with, with who? Elvis Presley was the first uh, rock star to have read that and been influenced. All right. Taking care of business, baby. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Probably suggested to him by one of the Memphis Mafia. Um, this was actually given to John Anderson by... Um, by a member of King, King Crimson. At, well, that that makes more sense. Yeah, um, I guess. But 
Elvis. All right. Anyway, the book yeah. discussed uh, Christ's energy and uh, Sanskrit, the uh, oldest language on earth, according to the book. Uh, and Sanskrit was really, uh, revealed in four Shastric scriptures and ancient rituals. And this is actually the thematic architecture of this album. Uh, they, they try to follow that structure uh, in, in the album. So, and, 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 and surprisingly danceable. Now it's, <laughs> It's now this is and uh, I think and critics of yes would, would suggest that this is where they really start to go off the rails a bit. But well, um, I think they, they would be in agreement with that one. Uh, yeah, he, it he, he left after this album for the yeah, first it, time. He left yeah. for the first time after this album. But uh, it's but it does go to I mean, so it, it speaks to a lot of things happening in terms of you know the, the era. But also then the kind of interplay between um, Dean and Anderson and Dean and the band. I mean, there's there's a lot of. <clears throat> I mean, Dean has tremendous influence. I mean, it's I think I would dare say unprecedented influence in terms of how he is shaping the music in inter interesting sorts of ways. Well, and um, the thing is, apparently all sorts of people had ideas for what should be on this album cover, uh, <laughs> and he tried to incorporate as many as he could. Um, it he does himself, sort of look like it, yeah. He himself shows some famous rock formations, uh, such as Brimham's Rocks, um, or The Last Rocks at Land's End in Cornwall. Oh, yeah. Um, the Logan Rock at Treen in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the Standing Stones of Avebury and uh, Stonehenge. Anderson asked him to include, we see it here on the... Uh, on the right, uh, the Mayan Temple uh, in Chichen Itza, and Alan Watts, and we don't see his, it's, it, it's too uh, washed out, but he asked him to include um, some of the uh, strange lines, line drawings from the plain of Nazca in Peru. Yeah, those, yeah, the. Here are drawings. Here, it's also washed out. Now you can see it a little bit. There's a little fossil of a fish. Here is a prehistoric fish, and here are some rainbow trout. It's it's a very interesting mix. And even here, we have a trademark waterfall and a trademark wow. pathway. So it's, it's Roger Dean, after all. Right. This getting a lot in to a, a relatively small space, that is um, topographic tales of the topographic oceans. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot. This is one of uh, one of Dean's personal favorites, uh, Relayer. That's 1974. It was the seventh studio album. Uh, as I said before, Wakeman had left the group uh, in May and was replaced by a Swiss keyboardist, Patrick Moraz of uh, mm -hmm. Refugee. He brought some right. funk and jazz elements to the yeah. album. Uh, and the quote here is, uh, Relayer, I would say, was my masterpiece of drawing. Hmm. A pencil drawing yeah. with thin, barely perceptible watercolor washes, then ink drawing in the foreground. So that's the high paint uh, the high point, sorry, high point of my draftsmanship, if you like. Um, and he talks about the architecture, because you see here, there, we have some people riding on horses over a bridge. And they have a sense that these somehow are buildings or someplace where maybe people live. There are yes, pathways that's... Going it going up here it and feels as though it's yeah it's somehow it's a domicile of some sort yeah and uh for him it's the concept of the ultimate fortified city um here a quote pretty much all my designs could be built and ideally would be built but relayers one piece of architecture 
Oh, but Relayer is one piece of architecture which was not intended to be built. He was reading Lord of the Rings at the time. Well, yeah. He was inspired by that, inspired by the world. <laughs> and this was something that could be in that world somewhere, although uh, it's not a reference to anything that Tolkien specifically. No, it, it, fair, it that's right. But it's also interesting that, um, again, it's the, this the era, the influence of Tolkien in, in this, you know, the early 70s. I mean, Led Zeppelin. I mean, you know, the, for example, the other the other band he could have been uh, working with. It's um, I the, the only I voice this for me is one of the great Dean covers. Uh, the The snake is troubling for me. The the but uh, there's something about the color scheme here too that I just think is is outstanding. Well, he said um, he almost the watercolors were were less colors and more just a wash from the water where he had rinsed his brushes. It was very, very meant to be... Uh, ah, well, good. Yeah, very yeah. Low, low tone and, and, and so uh, on. I think it's quite striking, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. This uh, is not yes. This is from uh, the Gravy Train album, Staircase to the Day in 1974. Uh, striking for its fantasy creature and uh, its use of color and the ever uh, and omnipresent mushrooms. Anyway. Uh, yeah, it, and this is Gravy famous, Train. Famous image. Yeah, Famous Image. Sure. Gravy, Gravy Train is the band, I guess. This is this is reminiscent of our conversation, our extended conversation about hypnosis, in that one of the things that, again, 40, 50 years later, regarding hypnosis covers, the art collective out of England, is that um, you, you may have never heard of the band or the or the the record, but the cover lives on, and and I think this is probably the same true with this particular group. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they they were able to uh, latch on to Dean is what makes was what makes this memorable. Um, and interestingly enough, there were two Yes albums uh, in the late 70s, uh, Going for the One uh -huh. and, uh, from 77 and Tormato. Oh, yeah. From 78. That's, yes. That Dean did not do the covers for. Well, no, he didn't. Do you know who did? Uh, was that Hypnosis? Hypnosis. You bet. Yeah. So, the and, tomato, the tomato cook cover is horrendous, and and again, it, it, yeah, it's really not. It's not. It's no. No one's high point there. You know, uh, it's interesting. Toward the end of their studies, uh, Storm Torgerson and and uh, Roger Dean actually uh, lived together in the same building. This is this is the thing, David. It's such a it's such a small world. Small I mean, world. It's just ama amazing, yeah. I mean, and they, they actually did an album cover together. Of course, they did. And Gene said it was awful. Yeah, oh. too many, too many cooks, probably in a probably. there. But, but again, you know, this is the, the thing about this is that um, in this era, people knew each other, worked together, and lived in the same building. It's just amazing. Yeah, uh, that brings us to the nineteen eighties. Uh, in 1980, uh, yeah. Yes got together to uh, make their 10th studio album. Uh, and Dean was back in the driver's seat with cover art. And he wanted to do, you know, the album's name is Drama. And Yes had a real feel for bringing it to the point when uh, naming their albums. I think that's right. Like Fragile, uh, this one, we see three cats chasing after two birds. And uh, it seems like this might kind of express the situation in the band. If we have two birds, like say, I'm one named Anderson, and one named Wakeman, who say, let's, let's take this to new heights. Let's make it avian. 
Uh, let's soar together, people. Um, and you have the rest of the members saying, no, we think something down to earth and feline is more what we're after. Uh, Anderson and Wakeman essentially accused the others of, of mobbing them, of just not listening to anything they would say. And so and they left right. uh, and would be replaced by uh, the Buggles, uh, Trevor Horn and Jeff Downs. Yeah, this is um, this is sacrilege uh, in the Yes community, but I think this is a terrific album. I think you can make an argument that this is the best Yes, al yes album, um, but you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the yes was splintering um and you get a little sense of that as you're suggesting here with the album cover itself it's uh, it's returned to form uh, uh for yes in terms of dean and um the album itself is uh the the song structure is um it's really interesting so not, not well, that you necessarily mean my recommendation but it's a it's i think it's a terrific album that the Buggles did not find out uh, that Trevor Horn and Jeff Downs were, were now in Yes until uh, they had to go for a tour. Uh, until <laughs> we, we, that, that, sounds, that, sounds, that sounds about right. Yeah. Anyway, Dean, Dean made a conscious effort to leave fantasy elements out of this. Yeah. Uh, he wanted to have something. We have down here uh, a shipwreck. Um, but everything else we see here also are things that we can imagine uh, existing in our world. It seems terrestrial there. Yeah, I, I think it's terrific cover. Um, he says, quote, uh, he, he, he wanted to have a stormy sky as a background with, quote, the light playing across the landscape. So there were some bits that jumped out and very stark and bright and other bits that are very dark, black on, on dark gray. Um, they came out in a way, I guess, that training and good luck worked together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 2013, Dean ranked this as one of his favorite paintings. Absolutely. So, um, there's that. And here, uh, also, no fantasy elements whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, another, yet another uh, live album, their second from 1980. And uh, Dean did this one well, uh, as well. Very simplistic, uh, but very aesthetically pleasing, I find. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And then uh, here we go. The second compilation album, classic, yes. Uh, what I find interesting about this one is that my eyes tell me, first of all, oh, there's some more Dean waterfalls here. Oh, but they're but they're not. They're just spaces between rocks uh, looking out into the other side of the, of the lake. It, Here we have that, the, yeah. the bridge and this piece of architecture, a building probably, but one yeah. that, that really reflects the, um, the natural uh, Which is, environment right. as this well. This is the, uh, uh, yeah, a Dean Hall Hallmark. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah. this brings us to a completely new chapter. This is this is, yeah this is uh, this is interesting. So right so uh, right you have the emergence of the supergroup right so called supergroup uh, yes. Asia, which includes then um, a, a member of Yes, but uh, well two members of Yes if you if you count Jeffrey well, Downs. Okay, well okay. All right, we have Jeffrey all. Downs and Steve Howe. Okay, um, it is. I recall um, hearing so the opening track was the lead single "Heat of the Moment," and that guitar riff um, is an all timer. And I remember then uh, seeing this album in the store and putting the guitar riff and this, I mean, I just thought it was a perfect, kind of a perfect melding. And this, um, I mean, Asia, Asia definitely benefited from Dean's participation here. I mean, I, I, there's, there's just no question about it, but this is, yeah, this just jumps, this just jumps. 
Well, well, well. Uh, How and Downs both wanted him. Uh, and it, uh, there was, of course, some fear that it might make the association with Yes too strong. Uh, but they had some discussions about how they could avoid that, and one of them uh, was the the logo. Yeah, right. Uh, which was not at all a bubble logo. It's very, uh, very edgy uh, in a very little literal sense. Um, the uh, the record company was not at all pleased. Oh uh, well, not at all they, pleased. They were so wrong. And they, uh, uh, one of them said to uh, to Carl Palmer, um, "Look, you've got a logo that no one can read on a dark cover that no one's going to see." And we don't hear a single. <laughs> well, oh, how many? How many? Yeah, ended up selling fourteen million. Uh, yeah. Companies, so, how many yeah. ways can you be wrong? Um, good grief! Yeah, it's. Um, I this is. I think this is a terrific. It's a terrific album, but it's one of the great covers. It's one of the great well, covers of all time. Rolling Stone Reader Survey uh, ranked the cover as the second best of all time. Absolutely. Oh no, not absolutely. It's not anywhere close oh. to that. But um, all right, it's it's it's, it's, it's a good cover. It's, it's terrific. Cover. It's, so, it's 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 more than just adequate, but it's not the second best of all time. So would so is the is the first? So I'm just curious. Do you recall what the first number one was in the Rolling yes. Stone survey? What 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 would you guess? I would guess it would be the Tom Petty second album. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Um, Oh, I would. I I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna go with going on a limb and maybe Sergeant Pepper. Yeah, it was Sergeant Pepper. Uh, I might have got Dark Side of the Moon, but yeah, talk about. I mean, sacrilege. Here we go. Sergeant Pepper. It's a cluttered mess, isn't it? It's a good album cover. It it might not be. The it's a best. cluttered it's mess. In the, isn't it's it? in the top ten. I'm yeah, not sure. I, this. I'm not sure this one is. Oh. Well, okay. Well, we see it differently. It, all right. All right. So that is the beginning of an association uh, that's also going to continue till today. Uh, yeah, this, that's that's right. And I, the second one. And again, here um, we don't have any fantasy elements beyond fantastic architecture. Yeah, uh, I think that's could, that's right. Could conceivably be made, but all the natural elements are things that we could see or could conceivably see. That, I think that today's yeah, world. that's right. And I and I did miss speak earlier. I mean, Dean, I think is associated with three bands: Uriah Heep, uh, yes, and I think Asia too. I mean, closely associated. Yeah, yeah. you know. So. Um, that took us up to uh, a point where, of course, uh, Anderson and Wakefield had left. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this was not the first departure for either of them. Um, that's I right. Know, I know Wakeman had already. Uh, that's that's right. Once. Yeah. So they decided they weren't even going to screw around with yes anymore. They were going to put together their own yes. Uh, and 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 that's what they did, and they just were decided they were going to have to name it differently, uh, which they then uh, went ahead and did. Yeah, this is um, <clears throat> this is where it gets uh, the the yes tree gets even more confusing, right? As these um, <clears throat> these splinter groups, which are kind of well, they are yes, it's essentially yes. Um, and it's fascinating that Dean continues to work with kind of with all sides and that all sides want to work with Dean, I think. Right. Yeah, no, a good thing. And uh, again, here we see um, something very similar to what we had in the, in the uh, last Asia uh, album cover. You could see this as essentially three different pictures overlapping. Mm -hmm. The first picture, Bryce Canyon, right? Just 
straight, straight Looks like it, straight out of our world. And then uh, you lay a nice little lake down in the middle of Bryce Canyon, and you've got that. And then you just add some bit of futuristic architecture that that Dean thinks is, is cool, and and you've got your picture, right? right. So that's right. I, again, uh, he's staying away from fantasy landscapes, fantasy creatures, um, and and his entire fantasy at this point is being played out in the architecture. Mm -hmm. Right. That was 1989. In 1990, Asia came out with a compilation album, Then and Now. Uh, it was a double CD um then was from the first two asia albums and now it's essentially everything that they had done after how left and excuse me for thinking this but um dean phoned this one in right I, uh, yeah yeah i i i think that's fair i mean he definitely he definitely spent 15 or 20 minutes Took took elements from the first four uh, uh, albums and, and put them in a maze and then put uh, apparently the the earth above it. And it's not it's not uh, his greatest creational moment. I think that's I think that's right. But again, um, Asia knows a good thing when they have it. It has become part of the Asia uh, Asia brand. And so you have a if you have a new album, uh, you have an, a, a Dean cover, even if it's kind of half baked. Yeah. This uh, this is so, this is such a yeah. this is union. And by the way, um, this is the first use of the square yes logo, but it kind of makes sense to have two different yes logos. Since this album includes two separate, almost distinct and separate I, yes groups, I, I guess in, in, in union, right? right? I yeah. mean, you have Anderson on vocals, uh, Trevor uh, Rabin, uh, Rabin on bass and, and, and vocals, Chris Squire bass and vocals, uh, Rick Wakeman on keyboards, but also Tony K on keyboards. You have uh, Bill Bruford on drums, but also Alan White on drums. Uh, Steve Howe, of course, uh, on guitar. It's as I, much yes as you can put together in one band, I think. I think, I don't I think, think that's a, well right. This Agreed. is an eight member, an eight member group at this point, and uh, it's it's the union of all of all yes members. And uh, the the, the uh, tour for for Union uh, pretty much convinced Steve Howe that he was uh, he was done uh, doing a yes tour. Well, that was, that needed, was the end of that. Yeah, you needed an extra big stage. That was it's a, a, a catastrophe, apparently. Well, and, and again, what melds it? Part of what melds us all together um, is again another Dean cover. Um, I don't think particularly uh, dynamic or memorable, but uh, once but it has you know some of the typical Dean elements, right? The, the curved rock formations, um, usually these are in the form of arches of some sort. But here they're more perpendicular. Um, That's right. Yeah, it's not a, not a particularly memorable uh, album cover, but it is very typical Dean. Again. Yes. Notable for its uh, introduction of the second yes logo. This bit, now here we go, uh, is notable for not being recognizable as a Dean cover in the least. I think you could uh, show people who who grow grew up with Dean and consider themselves huge Dean fans this album cover and ask them who did it, and they would have no clue. Uh, yeah, so I mean, obviously, he's well, he's trying to do something different. 
Um, and it is different. It's not all that particularly successful. Um, I think the, yeah. the, the, let the lettering maybe the let is as close maybe. As, as you get, but it's just, I guess so. Yeah. Anyway, this is, uh, Howe's third solo effort, um, from 1991. Uh, and again, for me, uh, notable for not being at all at all Dean like a, a, right. as, as big a dep is, departure from his style as I which is a yes right which is apparently the point yeah okay here we have yes years and we have so much yes in this we have the the square logo up here yes years we have yes years in the bubble uh logo down here and we have yes again bubble you know, so it's it's very affirmative sure. plenty o logo um, yeah, we, and, and uh here we have the the, the floating the floating islands floating rocks that uh, have become part of his thing and uh trees are trees are looking very oriental at this yes point. they are and of course, again you have the requisite reptile the in reptile, the foreground yes yeah uh all a reptile that I think we could we would not be surprised to find on Earth. We would be surprised uh, to find floating floating islands, but uh, this even has one of the team waterfalls. Yeah, uh, you know, um, Dean sued uh, James Cameron in 2013 uh, yeah. because uh, of his. Uh, world in Avatar that also featured like floating, huge floating rocks and stuff. Uh, sued him for 50 million, and the judge just threw it out, said he saw no similarity. I, yeah, it you watched Avatar, right? You've I have it. not, no. Wow. No, but I mean, do you, sure, do you have there, a club sure. of people who meet uh, people who have not seen Avatar? It must be a small club. Yeah. Well, yeah, we call it the the, the tasteful, the tasteful <laughs> ten. The um, I, there is. I mean, there are some some overlaps, and there are again some similarities. But um, the judge wasn't overwhelmed, and I, you know, I think, I think that that's that was a fair ruling. Oh well, I think anybody who. Saw Avatar had and and was familiar with Dean Covers had a very strong sense of deja vu. So oh, okay, well, all right, well. Anyway, that's uh, it just reminded me of this. This is a uh, yes years. Yes years was the the first box set. Uh, it was released in August ninety one by Atco Records. Atco, yeah, they won Atco. out the well. Atco, an um, Atlantic subsidiary, of course. Right. Yeah, famous famously it was um E Townsend solo stuff was always on Atco. The um yeah, so the, the a box set. Hmm. Yeah, when 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 yes left uh no warm up for, to that idea for Arista, um uh, in their eight man formation, uh part of the deal was that Atco would get the rights to the band's back catalog going back to 1969. Well, that's and that's that's where that, the gold is. That's huge. It's just huge, and and so they said, "Well, let's strike while the iron's hot," and they just put out this incredible wow. box set of like everything. So, yeah. Well, a wise move. Oh, here we go. Aria. Uh, Aria. Uh, yeah. This is, from 1994, Asia's fifth studio album, um, released by Mayhem Records, and um, the the painting is called Bridges. Mm -hmm. And we see it here oh, in beautiful. its entirety. Yeah, and uh, I I think it's not a, a huge stretch to understand where that uh, title came from. Uh, Agreed. Yeah. Although these bridges look almost more like like buildings of their own rather than mere uh, ways of crossing from one island to another. Well, and again, it's now been fifty years since he spent that, or nearly fifty years since he spent that time 
in Asia, but you, you can see his youthful, yeah, that those, those youthful inf influences still coming this forth. Is a, this is very Asian. The trees are yeah. Asian, the rocks are Asian. So, yeah, uh, and certainly the bridges uh, look very, very yeah. Asian, very yeah. Oriental. Okay. This is um, Steve Light, Uriah's, Uriah Heap's 19th album. <laughs> um, Sorry. But it's the, yeah. third, it's the third one that he uh, did a cover for. And uh, yeah. this is this is not at all a departure from the, the covers he's doing at the time, but it's a huge departure from the first two Uriah Heap. Well, it absolutely is. And where's the wizard? Where's the wizard? Where's the wizard? The wizard's gone. I so, mean, well, then what's the point? Yeah, it's kind of what's the point? That The point right now is... Um, We've got Roger Dean doing our cover. So that's that's the point. I guess I guess so. Yeah. And here, Keys to Ascension from uh, 1996. Uh oh, it's just well, it's kind of like a, a copy and paste sort of thing with him now. Well, we'll we'll use one of my oriental trees and we'll use uh some of my uh, arch rock formations, and we'll use a, a floating rock, and then we've got it. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's, that seems about that seems about right. Yeah. Anyway, this was the fourth live and fifteenth studio album, <laughs> uh, double album. Um, Trevor Rabin and uh, Tony Kane have left. Steve Howe and Rick Wakeman return. They're back, baby. All right, so uh, yeah, it's a double album. One of the one of the albums is one of the CDs is a live CD, and the other is a, a, their fifteenth studio album. Uh, there again, for those of you scoring at home, this is again the fourth studio album, or fourth live album. Fourth. Well, live. wait. This is also keys to ascension. Keys to wait. ascension two. The dose. Well, if they're going to title it the same, I don't need to come up with a different painting. All right, and this is the fifth, the fifth live and 16th studio album. Fifth live, those of you scoring at home, fifth live album. All right, so uh, keys a, to yeah. Ascension 1 and 2. Here's a little bit, uh, something a bit different. Uh, Us and Them. When Worlds from Collide, the, Pink Floyd. From the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh, and we see... Uh, uh, one of our fantasy reptiles, uh, yeah. a dragon, apparently, uh, here in the foreground. Uh, and there in the background, we even see one flying. Here we have like samurais or, or something uh, fighting. You shall not pass uh, onto this bridge, whatever. Uh, and the bonsai trees and the uh, all very oriental uh, with some fantasy elements uh, thrown in again. Yeah, but, but why this is, yeah. Again, right. this is not Pink Floyd, but it is Pink Floyd's music. Uh, of course, the Pink Floyd albums were done, uh, certainly the, the early ones, the classics, uh, were all done by hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Right. But uh, he stepped up for, for this one. All right. <laughs> Weird rock formations with bridges, friends and relatives from 1998. Uh, I, I submit, yeah, okay. I submit yeah. that with the weird rock formations, I, I submit that the, the title is even weirder. Well, this is a double CD compilation of their songs by um, individual yes members and, uh, and other associated artists. Okay. Okay. Yes, the latter, the 18th studio album. And here, uh, one has the sense that these two travelers are moving from bridge to bridge on the way up. Which yes, is one a has type of, a type of ladder. It is type, a type of ladder. And one also has a sense that these travelers have been here before. But. <laughs> <laughs> I think anyone crossing a bridge in a funky stone formation 
It's going to have it's, a sense of deja vu. This all looks vaguely familiar. Somehow. Vaguely familiar, yes. <laughs> and uh, Rick Wakeman returned to the center of the earth, uh, a fascinating mm -hmm. little project uh, in and of itself. Uh, and oh, well yeah. received. Agreed. Agreed. Narrated yes. by Patrick Stewart. Um, this was from uh, 1999. So uh, closing out the, the 20th century. And what do we have? Rock formations and a bridge, a natural bridge this time. Yeah, and it's interesting that uh, Dean didn't handle Wakeman's, um, his early his earliest solo records. I mean, um, the, the Henry of the Eighth Project and the Center of the Earth Project, uh, neither of those were Dean covers. It's just interesting that he comes back to Dean all these years later. Well, but he just, uh, uh, the King Arthur thing was a, was a Dean cover and yeah okay fair so point he's, yeah he's done, a, he's done a few things for Wakeman um and Steve Howe a return to the classic style right with elements oh look funky stone formation with a natural bridge yes um well I guess there's just no limits to the variations on that theme. Um, well, 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 we're going to find out. No, no, we're not because uh, this is we've we've taken Dean basically first through the first thirty years uh, yeah. of his career, and um, he had he came up with a number of really brilliant uh, albums after this, but um, uh, this is this is the end of our cherry picking. I think it's sufficient to, to see what the sure. man's about. When we talk about Dean's style, it becomes very clear what's meant by that. Um, so much so, in fact, that he inspired um, imitations. <laughs> and I bet that there are people out there who still think that this is a Dean album. Well, the dog, and, and why wouldn't you? 1975. I, I think um, that I did for a long time. I I certainly did. Um, it's the the sixth studio album by uh, the Scottish band, and um, their be and their best album, by the way, for what oh, it's worth. I, I think it's I, I think it's pretty good. I, I mean, agree. I agree entirely, and um, and it's a fantastic uh, album cover, and it has uh, fantasy creatures with funky wings. And uh, strange rock formations that look a little bit like mushrooms. Yes, I don't know how anyone would come up with the idea that this might be a Dean album. And Dean C and Dean sued James Cameron. I mean, come on, what, what's going on here? Well, yeah, I, I, he he might have had some success uh, oh, suing David Fairbrother Rowe who is the artist uh, behind this. Well, imitation, right? It's, it's, yeah. It's a serious form. But uh, David Fairbrother Rowe actually has uh, uh, two or three very distinct uh, drawing or painting styles, as opposed to Dean, who pretty much sticks to one, one direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, certainly this one style is very uh, Dean derivative. Uh, and yes. here we have John Anderson's Oleus of Sun Hillo from yeah, this one seventy six, and this one fooled me. It fooled me for decades. I mean, not I, I didn't. I would just assumed. Yes, well, because it looks like something straight from the Fragile LP or something. Exactly, like and and this is actually um, the story of Oleus is uh, is is very intimately connected with the uh, Fragile story. Um, and we have the we have the little space arc uh, right there. This was uh, Anderson's debut solo album, and he really, really wanted to get Dean to do it. But um, Dean was really busy with a lot of other projects, and um, you know they their relationship was good enough uh, that Dean wasn't just blowing Anderson off. So there must have been something to that, but. Uh, someone told him, well, if you can't get Dean, get the next best thing. This guy's done some work for Nazareth that looks just like Dean. He can probably do it. 
guess so. That he did. It's also David Fairbrother. Well, yeah. So. Yeah. There you go. It's, uh, you know, there are, you know, um, other artists who've, whose work is, you know, uh, deeply associated with uh, rock bands. Um, I think the John Pashy slash Craig Brown's um, tongue logo for the Rolling Stones, which has been, you know, a part of the Rolling Stones identity for half century now. I mean, that's, that's clearly a pairing, but you have, I mean, the fact that the yes is so deeply wed to, um, to Dean's vision, I think is, is unique and um, extended far beyond just album covers. Again, Dean had a role in stage design and, and again, as you think about the licensing and whatnot. Well, and, and, and again, Dean, Dean and his brother Martin, these are, this is one of those things where they work very closely together. Um, yeah. And uh, Dean continued to do uh, architectural work and architectural design. Uh, also with his brother Martin, the two of them collaborated very closely throughout uh, Dean's career. Um, just might be worth mentioning um, that in 2016, uh, the Isle of Man post office issued a, a series of six stamps uh, in honor of Dean mm -hmm. uh, with the paintings meeting place, uh, which was produced exclusively for the stamp issue, uh, Blind Owl Late Landing uh, from an unreleased Blind Owl album cover, Pathways from Yes Songs, Green Parrot Island, um, Tales from Topographic Oceans, mm -hmm. and Sea of Light. Um, Dean had has had a long relationship with the Isle of Man, uh, uh, especially with its long-term resident, Rick Wakeman. So uh, maybe that was a, a natural choice. Yeah, probably so. For, for them. So if you're going to uh, hitch your wagon to rock acts uh, and, and make a career of doing their album covers, you could make worse choices than yes and asia um for i think that that's that. i think that that's right not only in terms of their success but also very prolific and so you had um, lots of bites at the apple with with both groups so and yeah. the longevity of both groups is also fairly uh incredible Indeed. Um, yeah it's true. in whatever incarnation i mean oh, that's, you know, that's right um, yes, had uh, approximately a dozen incarnations, but they they remained together as a group in one form or another. Uh, and of course, the spin-offs uh, of, of the solo work uh, also provided him with a lot of work. So, so fascinating um, care, fascinating artist, um, interesting set of stories, and um, again, uh, this is part of what makes uh, rock art. So, so compelling is that uh, the visual um, melds with the, uh, with the RO and, and the music is just, you know, and with Yes, that was the key part of the experience is that, you know, as you're listening to the album, you're taking in the album cover. Everybody did it. Yeah. And Dean has gone on to do all sorts of stuff for, uh, for video games, computer games and things like that as well. That's right. But it's, I think you could argue that he was the single most uh, influential cover artist uh, in the 70s. Oh, and, I think and, that's... And going forward. Yes, no question. I agree. If you enjoyed this video, and we hope you did, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel right here. Uh, you can watch uh, another rock art uh, right up here. Mm -hmm. Or... Uh, Always recommended. Check out the playlist that's right here. Lots of good music. That's right. Especially for Yes and Asia fans. So until next time. Bye-bye. We'll Take care. Bye-bye.